Order, order. Giles Watling to move the motion. The import and sale of fur in the UK. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship today. Um, as members here will be more than aware, the welfare and protection of animals uh, is an issue our constituents can care deeply about. As a country, we have a proud track, uh, track record of leading the, the charge on the international stage in animal protection law. Only last year, we marked the bicentenary of the UK's first animal protection law, indeed the first national animal protection law in the world, Martins Act, the Cruel Treatment of Cattle Act 1822. So we in the UK lead the way. We know that in our ever more connected world, British people are both informed about and are concerned by the plight of animals, not just in this country, but also overseas. And we are rightly and perhaps especially concerned when animals suffer overseas in order to be turned into products that eventually reach the UK as a consumer market or an important trading hub. And that's what today's debate is about. It's about the double standard that we currently have, whereby fur farming is banned across the UK on the grounds of ethics and welfare, but we will continue to allow the imports of farmed fur from animals who have suffered overseas. It's about recognising that when it comes to protecting the welfare of sentient animals, it's not enough to simply prevent cruelties from occurring in our own backyard. We must look beyond our shores and ensure that we are not perpetuating the infliction of cruelty overseas by trading in cruel product products like fur. The government's 2021 action plan for animal welfare pledged to explore action on the UK fur trade, noting that whilst it's important to import, it's illegal to import seal, cat and dog fur, it is still possible to import other fur from abroad. During June 2021, the government conducted a call for evidence on the fur market, which received almost 30,000 responses, though it is yet to release a summary of those responses or a policy position. And it is on this point that I hope we may have some progress, and I'd like to hear from my honourable friend, the Minister today. Today's debate regarding the UK fur trade may be seen as a debate on its face to be about, about uh, animal welfare problem. And indeed, animal welfare will feature significantly in my remarks today. However, this is also a debate on trade in an unsustainable product that is causing great environmental harm and a product whose production carries significant and extremely concerning human health risk through strong association with the spread of zoonotic diseases, including COVID-19. But let's begin with the animals themselves and their experience in the global fur trade. Fur farming has rightly been banned across all nations of the UK since 2003. We were the first country in the world to ban fur farming and we blazed a trail that now 18 countries have followed. With legislation for fur farming bans currently progressing through parliaments of Romania and Lith Lithuania. The shrinking list of countries that continue to allow the farming of animals for their fur include Finland, Poland and China, and across all countries where animals are farmed for their fur, the conditions are broadly similar. I'd be happy to give way. Thank you very much for giving way and for bringing this debate um, to the floor of the House. This is a really important and it's one that our constituents care very deeply about. He's talking about um, other countries that have continue to fur farm um, but of course here we've got a ceremonial hat worn by the king's guard that is made from the pelt of canadian brown bears um, doesn't he think it's about time we looked for alternatives for that because there it is right in the center of any big parade we have this symbol of cruelty to animals Thank you. Uh, I, I thank my honourable friend for, for her intervention, and I, I'm so glad you did mention the fur cap. I, I'm not specifically going to be referring to that, but it is absolutely true. I think it takes one bear to produce one cap. These caps, of course, are a lot of them very ancient and they're historic, but we now have alternative products, and alternative products that are very effective and very long, long wearing. Um, and there's absolutely no reason why we can't trans to, uh, move over to that. But we need to talk to the Ministry of Defence about that and take it further. And it's something I'd be glad to pick up. But thank you for your intervention. Now, going back to the conditions of uh, animals on fur farms, um, including foxes, raccoon dogs, minks and chinchillas, they're kept in wire battery cages, typically, typically no larger than one metre squared, according to the industry's own literature. 
They spend their entire short lives, typically around eight to nine months, in these cages. They're never permitted to run, dig, swim, hunt, or any of the other behaviours known to be vital to their physical and mental welfare. In the, I'd be delighted to give way. Thank the Honourable Member for giving way and for securing such an important debate. He's making extremely powerful comments. I wonder what he makes of the comments from the former CEO of the British Fur Trade Association and former Director of Standards at International Fur Federation, Mike Moser. After 10 years spent defending the fur trade, he now dedicates his life to being an anti-fur campaigner, confessing that neither welfare regulations nor any industrial certification scheme would ever change the reality of these animals being stuck in tiny wire cages for their entire lives. Doesn't this add to the argument that there's no such thing as humane fur farming? I thank the Honourable Member for her intervention, and, and I couldn't agree more. And in fact, I shall be quoting that very quote later on in, in my remarks. Uh, uh, and I, I think you'll find that we agree wholeheartedly over that issue. Um, in the case of minks, specifically, uh, of whom an estimated 20 million are farmed in these tiny wire cages every year, Veterinarians and welfare experts point out that as these are naturally solitary and wide-ranging animals in the wild, keep being kept row upon row, just centimetres from their equally unfortunate neighbours, is doubtless for these mink a very stressful environment. Such, such cramped and barren conditions comprehensively fail all scientific measures used to ensure that animals are kept in conditions that meet their welfare needs such as the five freedoms or five domains of animal welfare. Unsurprisingly, such conditions lead to both physical and psychological suffering. So ubiquitous is the suffering in these cages that the fur industry builds into its so-called welfare assurance schemes an ambition to keep this percentage of animals suffering from diarrhea, purulent discharge from the eyes, obvious skin lesions, severe gum or tooth infections, to less than 10%. I'd be happy to give way. I'm extremely grateful to him for giving way. And can I reiterate the comments of other colleagues uh, on congratulating the Honourable Gentleman for securing this debate? Does he share the concerns that some have in relation to human health in terms of the impact, the impact on human health with these uh, fur farms in, in that they become reservoirs for disease? And in mind, when you look back to the recent pandemic we've experienced, that's another good reason for the UK Government to take the steps that the Honourable Gentleman is advocating. Uh, thank you. The Honourable Member for his invention, and it, it, we seem to be on a sort of a repeat cycle here. I shall be referring to those very, very issues uh, <laughs> later in my remarks, um, and I think you'll be very glad to hear them. Um, uh, these health problems are wide, widespread on, on fur farms and are the result of the gross, grossly inadequate conditions that the animals are forced to live in, which I have previously referred to. Investigations by organisations such as the Humane Society. International, to whom I'm incredibly grateful for their support with this debate, repeatedly show that the mental suffering of these wild animals, including a high frequency of stereotypical behaviours, such as pacing and rocking, as well as self-mutilation and cannibalism. Despite what the fur trade, fur trade might like consumers to believe, there is no such thing as humane fur farming. Industry-led assurance schemes of high welfare fur farming permit a wide range of cruel practices, including the use of battery cages and the use of cruel traps, including leg hold traps, even drowning traps for beavers. At the end of their tragic lives, minks are typically gassed to death, which veterinarians tell me is aversive to them. Of course it is. And it causes suffering. Of course it does. Whilst foxes and raccoon dogs are mostly anally electrocuted. Sickeningly, investigations, including one by the Humane Society International in 2020 in China, showed that animals, cruelty, animals are crudely beaten to death with metal poles and even skinned alive. I'd be delighted to give way. The Honourable Member for Clackton for giving way, and he's making a very fine speech. I suppose what brought it home to me was something that happened at school when I was 14 or 15, and our physics teacher, Mr. Thompson, took an amber rod and showed us how if you rubbed it, you would get a positive charge. But what he rubbed it with shook me to the core, and that was a, a, a pussycat skin, and he had a box of them. And he said, it's all right, they came from abroad. But you think, 
Honourable Member mentions wild animals. This is a domestic moggy, somebody's cat. And that's what put me right off it. And like the Honourable Member for Glasgow North West, I've had numerous uh, messages from constituents yeah. on this. I, I thank the uh, Honourable Member for his, in, his intervention. And, and he's absolutely right. And it does point out that it doesn't matter where these skins come from. It is something we should take very seriously and we should consider, consider very heavily legislating against. So I thank my honourable friend for his intervention. So could fur production be made humane, one might ask? The simple and truthful answer is no, because the fur trade's economic model remains completely reliant on these battery cages. There is no humane alternative to the fur trades model of intensive confinement. When the governments in Germany and Sweden brought in laws requiring that foxes were giving digging substrate and in Germany minks were provided swimming water, the respective segments of the industry closed down in those countries as it was no longer economically viable to meet the requirements of those very sensible laws. And it is not only animal protection organizations such as the HSI and the RSPCA who are calling time on the fur trade. Former CEO of the British Fur Trade Association, uh, Mike Moser, mentioned earlier by the Honourable Lady, um, resigned after 10 years defending the fur trade. And in September 2020, publicly pledged his support for Fur Free Britain campaign to ban fur sales in the UK here. Uh, and I will read out, it's worth reading it again, his statement for the House. This is what Mike Moses said. Over time, I realized that whatever sound bites we devised to reassure consumers, retailers, and politicians, neither welfare regulations nor any industry certification scheme would ever change the reality of these animals being stuck in tiny wire cages for their entire lives. It's a good point and a point well made. The majority estimated 95% of fur traded is from animals kept on fur farms. But let's move to wild animals. Wild animals trapped for their fur suffer different but similarly awful plights. Frequently caught in countries including the USA and Canada, Canada in cruel leg hole traps that have been banned in the UK since the 1950s. Animals such as coyotes and raccoons can suffer for days in traps before eventually succumbing to the elements to dehydration and then being killed in the trap. Horrifically, it is not at all uncommon for animals to rip or chew limbs off in a bid to escape. Such suffering is impossible to imagine and all for the purpose of a sentient creature ending up as trim on a jacket hood or indeed a fur cap. The case against the cruelty of the fur trade is straightforward to make. But perhaps less commonly understood is the fact that fur farms can act as a reservoir for viruses and present a risk to public health, as the Honourable Member mentioned earlier. Over 480 fur farms across Europe and North America have been affected by outbreaks of COVID-19 over the last three years, with six countries confirming spillover events from fur farms back to humans. Some 20 million animals were culled in order to protect public health. But mink farming still continues in several countries across Europe and beyond. An outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza on a mink farm in Spain last autumn has further raised, raised pandemic fears, with virologists from Imperial College London writing that it is incredibly concerning and a warning bell for humanity. A recent statement by the World Organization for Animal Health warns that some mammals, such as mink, may act as mixing vessels for different influenza viruses, leading to the emergence of new strains and subtypes that could be more harmful to animals and or humans. Recently reported infections in farm mink are a concern because infections of large numbers of mammals kept in close proximity of each other exacerbate this risk. So by importing animal fur, we are importing cruelty and we are facilitating a trade that could very well be the source of the next pandemic. Lastly, I'll briefly outline a final compelling reason 
for the government to act to end the UK fur trade and it's its insizable environmental footprint. A new report published by Humane Society International found that amongst the eight materials considered, fur from minks, foxes, raccoon dogs, they had the highest air emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, water consumption, and water pollution per kilogram. The carb carbon footprint of one kilogram of mink fur was found, found to be 31 times higher than one kilogram of cotton. And the water consumption in fur production was found to be five times higher than cotton, with a kilogram of fur requiring a staggering 29,130 litres of water. The fur trade is bad news for animals, it's bad news for human health, and bad news for the environment. An import ban, as they say in the vernacular, is a no-brainer. Thank you.